Welcome to ADHD is over, a new podcast on a seemingly old label that we're going to be peeling off. Join my wife, Tatiana, and I as we journey with our family, the Wyden family, through the land of confusing information. We're going to visit both sides and let you decide because the power is with you. Welcome to ADHD is over. Hey, welcome back to our podcast. My guest today is Dr. Bessel van der Kolk, a psychiatrist by training. Dr. van der Kolk has been a pioneer in trauma research for decades now and leads the Trauma Research Foundation. His 2014 book, The Body Keeps the Score, quickly became a bestseller. And although the book was first released seven years ago, he currently sits at number one on the New York Times bestseller list. Dr. Van der Kolk spends his career studying how children and adults adapt to traumatic experiences, and he has translated emerging findings from neuroscience and attachment research to develop and study a range of treatments for traumatic stress in children and adults. He has focused on studying treatments that stabilize physiology, increase executive functioning, and help traumatized individuals to feel fully alert to the present. This has included a National Institute of Mental Health funded study on EMDR, and a National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine funded study of yoga, and in recent years, the study of neurofeedback to investigate whether attentional and perceptual systems and the neural tracts responsible for them can be altered by changing EEG patterns. Today, I'm super excited to discuss the link between trauma and ADHD with Dr. Bessel van der Kolk. Welcome to the show. Good to have you. Good to be here. So I'm, I'd like to jump right in. I'm a parent. Uh, I'm doing research for other parents, and uh, a, a lot of parents that have children with ADHD, they unfortunately don't get to read all these amazing other books that um, that I get to read. And one one such book was your book, "The Body Keeps the Score," because we were diving into trauma, the link between trauma and ADHD. And although I don't find the word ADHD a lot when researching your name, I just wanted to kind of ask you right off the bat, like, what do you feel is the link, um, if any, between those two? I would have to say, first of all, I don't believe that the DSM is a valid scientific instrument. I actually Hmm. think it's a bunch of nonsense. And I think psychiatrists have gone to medical school and so they want to be respectable and make psychiatric diagnoses, but they're not real diagnoses. They're just list of symptoms and these lists of symptoms overlap with other lists of symptoms and they have different etiologies so this hyperactivity and inability to focus uh, has many different origins so i i love that and i totally agree with you would you say those symptoms are more like behaviors observed behaviors right? yeah, they're superficial behaviors and the, the way i talk about it in my book is uh before um before we knew something about we co- would call somebody having a postural disorder or a, a snot disorder. <laughs> but it doesn't tell us anything about what really goes on, you know? And all psychiatric diagnoses are purely superficial phenomena. And so you, people with very different problems get lumped together in one little box. Mm-hmm. And your work, and it's interesting, on one of the German uh, ADHD websites, they called you the Pope of the American Trauma Research. Oh I thought that God. was cute. I mean, you know about the history of popes. They're a long string of not very good people. Like, I, I'm sorry to hear that. Like, <laughs> well, I, I think the way the Germans meant it is probably more like an authority figure, and maybe they still I, respect the Pope. I don't know. But I, I just... I, I don't wear red shoes, and I don't keep lovers on the side. Like, like. <laughs> Good, good. Um, so what do you think then we can dive right into it since you talked about the DSM? What, what, what can labeling a child with a quote unquote mental disorder, what can that do to a child? That's of course devastating. Huh? And particularly if you're not a very well-educated person and you're uh, living in circumstances that are not as privileged as let's say mine, uh, these labels become attached to you and you think about yourself in AD as a kid with a, with a disorder. I'm a disordered person. And these labels stick with you for the rest of your life. It's like you need to be extraordinarily careful labeling people with these diagnoses. And perhaps uh, that, that could lead us to, um, you know, in your book, you talk about how the body keeps the, the score, but the mind sort of hides it or tricks us in hiding it. Um, 
can that be if you if you think of children with ADHD, uh, if they keep telling themselves that they're disordered? I mean, that's got to play a huge trick on their minds that they they eventually can't shake that off. And so it stays in the body. Right. Yeah, How does that really, you get a deep sense of I'm defective, huh? deep sense of shame. And then you need to pretend like you're somebody who you aren't. Yeah, because the way I am is not good enough. I need to be fixed. Huh? And, you know, you know there, there are kids who really, for whatever reasons, have extreme problems with attention, concentration, focus, etc., etc. And uh, they need to be helped to focus. And the question is, how do you do it? Of course, doctors, you know, write about in my book, have we live in a post-alcoholic culture. So the only thing that doctors know is... Um, we give people a pill uh, and maybe doing some talking. But the idea that you need to move or engage in physical activities or maybe take time off to restore the uh, balance in your system is not part of the medical system. So once you get that label, you fall into the medical system, you get medicalized and we go to get fixed. Like one of my kids really would have met diagnosis for ADHD and some other stuff. Thank God I was a psychiatrist who knows the inaccuracy of these labels. We never gave him drugs, but we really worked very hard on getting him to be able to focus. Martial arts was very helpful for him. Being in a theater group was very helpful for him. Playing music was very helpful for him. Yeah, uh, And that's because, you know, I'm a privileged person who is able to spent the time and the energy to really figure out what's helpful for him. If he had gone into the mainstream medical system, he would be a non-functional adult right now uh, on numerous drugs. Uh, I see this all the time now. Like, I see a lot of parents who adopt children. It's very hard. Many adopted kids are quite damaged by their early experiences. And then they go to an expert, and the expert, then they say, what should we do? And I always say to them, talk to other parents. Because I don't have a, a kid living at home who I've adopted out of an orphanage. I, mean, I read about it, I study it, but the real experts are the people who live it the day and night to see what happens to people. Now, did you, um, with your own son, did you also, because you speak about neurofeedback, right? Um, the, the altering the EEG pattern. Is that something that you've come across with? I didn't, like I didn't know about neurofeedback in those days yet. But if I known about neurofeedback, I would certainly have to, would certainly have done neurofeedback. Yeah, that that's something that you're seeing real results with, uh, uh, sort yeah. of altering those patterns. You know, like with everything, one size never fits all. It's always let's see, let's try. Uh, but certainly, there's a pretty go robust body of evidence for people who are labeled ADHD doing well with with uh, with neurofeedback. Uh, but sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. With my son, if I actually the guy who treated my son was a lovely, lovely guy, who eventually started the neurofeedback with the other kids who we saw. But that's we learned that later. Yeah, right, because it came along later. Yeah, and um, you, <clears throat> when we talk about trauma, we've also interviewed um, a Peter Levine, who you mentioned in the book as well, and. We've looked at the ACE studies and, you know, this is information that a parent, when, when their child is first diagnosed, it's not readily available. It's not the top search in Google when you say, oh, ADHD, what, do, what is it, right? Well, and it shouldn't be. Huh? Uh, in that, you know, just about every trauma test kid who I've seen would meet diagnostic criteria for ADHD. But I wouldn't say that in a general population, um, the majority of people with ADHD, it's the result, the result of trauma. I once had a, a group for all incest victims, group therapy, and there was one person who was not an incest victim, but who had terrible ADHD along the classical lines. And she was just as messed up as the incest victims because she's always been treated like a weird person. She always mm. felt abnormal. She always felt that she was a, not a good person, etc., etc. So she became traumatized by having that label pasted on her. And also not only the label, but of course, once you cannot concentrate and pay attention, uh, you cannot keep up with other people. It, it's quite a hard thing to, to live with, actually. And mm -hmm. then the interesting contrast is also that 
once people know that there's a label for what their problem is, they feel better. Huh? So, yeah. Oh, the, the textbook says that I have that, and that means there's hope for me. And so to some degree, the labels are helpful. To some degree, the labels are damaging. Mm. Yeah, I hear, <clears throat> excuse me, we hear this a lot where somebody says, oh, finally, now I know what's wrong with me. Right, right. right. <clears throat> so they don't feel like they're a bad person, but now they have a, this this thing, right? This condition. Yeah. Um, and it's good to have some sort of capacity to make meaning out of what's going on. And it, it's really a meaning, DSM is a meaning making system. Like, oh, now I understand I have bipolar illness. Like. Nobody ever can find out the underlying biology, but at least I have a little label now. Yeah. Right. There's some reference, almost like a shorthand, right? But I would really much look at um, what can your kid do, what the kid has troubles with, uh, what time of the day does it have trouble with it, how long can your kid sit still, uh, what allows your kid to be able to pay attention, what gives you your... What gives your kid the capacity to focus and to concentrate? When does it work? When doesn't it work? So what is there in the environment that can help and mold your child to be more focused? Huh? Does taking a break half hour, every half hour and uh, doing some shadow boxing or some, um, in the case of my son, he played a didgeridoo. And playing the didgeridoo was really fantastic for him. He didn't have to talk. He would go to parties and people would admire him for his didgeridoo playing. So he still fit in, even though he was <laughs> an at that point. He, as an adult, he's a perfectly normal person, by the way. What's important to keep in mind is that uh, kids keep growing and a lot of us have weird children, you know, um, and... You know, boys in particular are often very odd and have weird thoughts, etc. And then they slowly grow up and they mature. And if you live under uh, tolerant conditions and you are not harsh with the kid, they usually find a way of uh, the frontal lobe keeps growing. And if they've if really helped them to get a good frontal lobe of observing yourself and knowing yourself and knowing it works for you, uh, usually kids grow into it. I've, I've known any number of kids who were pretty weird and off the ball at age 14. And by the time they were 23, they were okay because the frontal lobe kept growing. Huh? Mm. Uh, so it's very, uh, what was for me very important is to uh, to have some, Teachers who would say to me, oh, yeah, we see a lot of kids like this, but over time they outgrow it. So, so it's, you feel panic now that, oh, my God, what's happened to my kid? But, but you know, if your kid today was still behaving like a two-year-old, you'd be panicked also. And so you, you, you know that your, your kid keeps growing, it keeps moving. And so it's important to, to know that it's a natural progression of human beings to become more and more reasonable and rational. Mm. Beautifully said. I love that. Yeah. It's letting our children unfold, like unfold. to become who they are. Right. Yeah. Instead of trying to mold them into who we think uh, they should become. But, but at, at the same time, we want to go to trauma route. If a kid sees a lot of discord around them, if they get scared by, their parents screaming at each other or hitting at each other, which is actually much more common than people pay, pay attention to it. If a kid is scared, they will develop ADHD-type uh, symptoms. Mm -hmm. uh, so a scared child isn't a child who's unable to concentrate. Uh, so what is that safety system like? Uh, how, can you, how can a kid be helped to feel safe? And that oftentimes even includes... Working with their bodies, huh? body work, huh? touching, um, uh, massages may be helpful, uh, physical activities, playing ball, playing sports, getting in sync with other people are always good things for, regardless of the origin of where the inattention comes from. Yeah, no, that's great. Now, I, we've heard, because um, I remember I heard about the ACE study the first time, it was a TED Talk by Nadine Burke Harris the Surgeon General of California, and she had mentioned it, and she said, uh, I'm paraphrasing, but that the brain can only, that part of the brain can only either uh, do executive functioning or development, or it's processing what's going on in the child's life, but it can't do both at the same time. 
I think that's essentially true. And again, that's not entirely true either, you know, because it's all more complicated. And that there's some people who are very traumatized who are able to escape in their frontal lobe and become brilliant scholars. Like, um, who invented mathematics? Uh, this British guy. He was very uh, Newton. Newton, Newton yeah. Newton mm-hmm. was a horrendously traumatized individual. Huh? And moved from one home to another, uh, kicked out of his mother's house, etc., etc. Uh, and then he found refuge in mathematics. Uh, so sometimes some traumatized people find a refuge in language or in math or in basketball is some particular talents and become very good at something as, as an escape hatch into pseudo normalcy. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean that your trauma goes away. But being very good at something is a very nice refuge against all the other stuff. So you cannot say, oh, you get traumatized, you get all messed up, you'll never accomplish anything. I think many traumatized people actually are extraordinarily successful. I think for, for, for me, that was soccer back in Switzerland growing up. I think I just jumped into, you know, three practices a week in one game and it kept me out of drugs and all sorts of stuff, you know. You say about talk about Switzerland. I I work with neurofeedback people in Switzerland, mm. and they say, "Oh, we don't see trauma in Switzerland. <laughs> there is no trauma in Switzerland." And then my other close collaborator is in Russia, and he says, "There's no trauma in Russia." I go like, "Wow, that's so cool." <laughs> <laughs> really. <laughs> I know that's. Uh, a, 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 yeah. But but, you, but you're right. It is a little bit of that mentality in Switzerland that there's no trauma, and I think it has to do with, you know, the description of trauma. We think it has to be this crazy uh, uh, domestic violence and abuse, which it is, right? But then there's also, I think, the lack of nurture and the lack of attachment. And you mentioned attachment theory. And um, how do you how do you where do we draw the line to say like, oh, that that has no impact on a child? That's too small of a trauma, and this does. I'm assuming it studies. You don't go so much by the events, you go by the kid's reaction. So if a kid freezes when she comes to the room and sees you, that means that they're afraid of something. Or if kids start smashing furniture when um, mom is talking to them or... that kid's reacting to something. So you really want to observe these things very closely and to see what is the child reacting to. Rather, uh, Oprah's latest book is called What Happened to You? And I think that's an important question. But even more important is what do you react to? What, what scares mm. you? What, what, what makes it... Have, at what moment do you lose that capacity to concentrate and to pay attention? Yeah, because obviously ADHD children are often labeled as checked out, right? They're checked out from yeah. from the present moment. So you you give your example. You played soccer. Uh, so the question is, if they're checked out, what helps to not be checked out? What actually rings their bell? What yanks their chain? What 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 allows them to to focus? And of well, course, yeah. often have these computer games. Huh? Sadly. I was just going to say that. That's exactly my next point. Uh, I was going to ask you, a lot of parents ask me this all the time. Uh, what about video games? Uh, they're, they're definitely not checked out there. They can really pay attention and focus, right? Is that maybe also their escape hatch? Is, uh, you said unfortunate, but could you elaborate on that? Well, actually, because I'm not an expert on ADHD stuff, I don't want to speak as if I were an authority. You know? Sure, sure. Um, for example, my son did very heavy video games uh, when he was 14, 15. And I was worried to death. Now that he's almost 40, he doesn't play video games. He has kids. They don't do screens at his home. And they do a lot of hiking and playing and drawing, etc., etc. So it doesn't seem to have ruined him. I uh, see. So, so what can we you know, what can we say? How do, what do we know? My reaction to my kid playing video games when he was a kid was like, oh my God, he, he will never amount to anything. And then again, he grew and he left it behind. So I don't want to make any predictive statements about these things. 
I, I love that. And I hear that story a lot, actually. And, and it's funny, my wife and I were in this moment right now. He's 12, our oldest who was diagnosed, uh, and he loves video games and he would do it all day long. Right. And we're like you said, we're worried to death. Like, yeah, is, yeah. is he going to amount to anything? And I think hearing more so stories like your, your own that, you know what, your son turned out. That, that's what every parent's well, worried about. Really, really well, actually. Like, you know, that just, uh, that's actually, that's why I talk about him, actually. He gave me permission to talk about it because uh, he, he came out okay. And so it's very, so it's very important for us as parents to not get into that predictive mode. Obviously, oh my God, it will never amount to anything. But to, had to really be very thoughtful about how we can set up conditions of increasing um, engagement. And in terms of computer games, of course, neurofeedback is wonderful because neurofeedback, you play computer games with your own brain. It's actually sort of exciting to see how your brain can make these spaceships move and the birds sing, etc., etc. And you can say, oh, my brain can do that. Would you say, um, I know this is kind of a... a um a very blanket question, but from what you've seen uh, make the most different uh, difference in altering brain patterns, would you say it's neurofeedback or uh, I know you've done studies on, on EMDR and other uh, methodologies? You know, I, I take theater very seriously and I'm actually involved in a program here locally where I live uh, called Shakespeare in the Courts where we juvenile delinquents, all of whom probably would be diagnostic criteria for ADHD, are being taught to be Shakespearean actors. And I, I just love that program. And it's very hard for them, but they learn that I have to be, stand, I need me to actually get up and be part of the group and I need to say my lines, I need to play the role, I need to act like a king, I need to act like a villain, I need to act like something. And it really helps them to really explore themselves and their own internal capacities and how to be in sync with people around them. I actually had a talk with the Dean Burke Harris recently and I, I said to her, we had a bit of a disagreement. I said, don't label these kids and don't medicalize it all. Uh, because medicine doesn't have the answer. Uh, uh, maybe theater teachers have more of an answer, or martial arts programs, or athletic coaches, or music teachers, or, I mean, really, uh, medicine, medic the medical world is uh, able to do a small segment of can what can help your kid, but not the whole thing, you know? Mm. Yeah, I was going to ask you uh, one of my... Uh... My last questions was going to be around medication. I know you've done research as well, not so much on ADHD medication, but um, what's your general stand on, I mean, you started talking about it, but what's your general stand on medication uh, being a solution versus a Band-Aid? Well, it is a Band-Aid, but I'm not opposed to Band-Aids. You know, I have a prescription blank right there, and occasionally I write prescriptions. They can be helpful to help people make us through the day and to not embarrass themselves and to stay more or less under control. But it's important to know, and I think that's my beef with psychiatry these days, is it should be a one-man band. Huh? And that the medications are maybe able to, um, to make you function, which is terribly important, of course, to make you not get kicked out of school, which is terribly important also. But uh, will it actually reset the brain? Probably not. Will take medications possibly interfere with the brain maturing itself? It's a very important question that we should ask ourselves. Uh, and there's some very strong opinions about that. As in some people we say these medicines interfere with the natural capacity for the brain to evolve. And I'm agnostic about it. Uh, uh, but as a parent, I would dig into that literature. I really think about what price am I paying for giving my kid these drugs? And I may decide to actually go with the drugs. But uh, So I would need not be dogmatic about it. But always be careful. Uh, does the solution become the problem? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's well said. Uh, lastly, is there anything else that you <clears throat> would like to say about somatic healing or, or getting uh, the, 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 the trauma out of the body? Um, in terms of, I know you've talked about exercise and, and, and we've talked about neurofeedback. Are there other 
practices or things you've seen from other uh, you know experts that work really well? Well, as far as trauma is concerned, working with the body is essential. The, your, 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 the housekeeping part of your brain is set to feel that your body is in, in danger, and you try to run away from the internal feeling of danger by shutting yourself down. And it's really important to really get into your body. What was helpful for my son also happened, happened to be, uh, was yoga happened to be helpful for him, and martial arts. Uh, but... I, I wouldn't say your kid will benefit from yoga and martial arts because I don't know how your kid got to be the old kid that he is. Uh, so so <laughs> I, I wouldn't prescribe it. I would say that's one thing that helps some people. Uh, but uh, there's increasing evidence. And I, I'm really glad that my book may, may make a little difference there. Uh, although much of what I wrote about in my book, I learned from Peter Levine and other body workers, is that you need to go into the body. And you need to have a friendly relationship towards your body and to nurture your body. And when you talk about the A study, Vince Valenti's study, he has all these symptoms. And when I look at all these symptoms, I go, these all are symptoms of you're not feeling comfortable in the body that you live in and have no respect for the body that you live in. So drug taking, medications, illnesses, all these things that the A study found has something to do with your having a being at war with your body in a way, uh, and so really feeling at home in your body by uh, um, going on outward bound programs or being part of a volleyball team. It, it, it's very important to my mind that your body needs to be in sync with other bodies, and I've, I very much learned that in places like China and in Africa, different cultures. And in China, when I first went, it was a very traumatized country. And all these people were doing Qigong together. Go like, wow, they're doing that, not for the tourists, because, but they have to. And when they make these body movements, it makes them feel in sync with the people around them. And I was just in China just before the pandemic. It's everywhere, ubiquitous. People are dancing and moving everywhere, unlike what we're doing. I go like, they're doing the right thing. They're doing it. Is that like the co-regulation? Is that oh, what, what that is? Absolutely. Absolutely. And what you discover with your kid, I'm sure, is you, it's hard to co-regulate. Mm -hmm. And so I think the challenge when you have a kid like this is how do you, how, how, what sort of ways can you find to co-regulate? Is playing a song on the piano helpful? Is playing a flute helpful? Is tossing a ball back and forth helpful. But that, that synchronicity between our bodies and other bodies is terribly at the core of it, of pleasure. And pleasure is really about, and like I'm having a good time talking with you because I feel like you're, we're in sync together. And so the, I'll say after, hey, I had this really nice interview because have we, we, you move your face with my face and vice versa, our voices are more or less just in harmony. And that's exactly what's missing when you get these diagnoses, how you really are not in sync with people around you. So the question is, how can we get in sync together? I love it. I love it. And I know that uh, we're, we're pressed for time. You're, you're a busy man. So I, we're going to wrap it up here. Um, but what a beautiful way to, to wrap it up with uh, being in sync with each other and helping each other heal. Um, and congratulations on your, on your uh, being on the, still on the New York Times yeah. bestseller number one. I'm going to claim spotters' rights. Like, hey, after three years, I can't kick me off anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love when I saw that. I loved it. I, I was just, I'm very happy for you. Um, thank you for doing the work you're doing and uh, for taking time to talk to me. I, I think this would be very helpful to a lot sure. of parents around the world. It's a pleasure talking with you. And I, I, I like your, your open thinking and your inquisitiveness. And I hope you can share that with the other parents because it's very hard. You know, we shouldn't minimize how hard it is to have a kid who is not in sync and who you yeah. need to be in sync with. It's, it's, it's arduous. It's a lot of work, but as my wife uh, likes to say, like, hey, th these are the cards we're dealt with, right? And, and we are benefiting from it because yeah. we have to transform ourselves in the process. That's right, that's right. You know? <laughs> so, uh, and congratulations on your son turning out, as, as they say, because I think that's a very important uh, success, success yeah. story for people to hear. 
So, uh, Dr. Bessel van der Kolk, uh, it was a pleasure, and uh, I'm sure our paths will cross again in the future. I hope so. Thank okay. you so much. Take care of yourself. Bye. Take care. Bye bye.